Diego go everyone, Kojima Tashi, and welcome back to episode number 42 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. How are you lot getting on? I haven't checked in for a while with you all. Has anyone done anything fun or interesting flute-wise? Has anyone hit any big targets or any big goals, whether you're a beginner or a seasoned professional? Is there anything good? Hit me up with your good news flute stories. Once upon a time, many months ago, I did actually ask you guys to do this and I got so many lovely messages of things you've done and it warmed the cockles of my wee Irish heart. But here, anyway, this week, lads, I've made a fucking mess of this. I've made a pig's ear of this fucking podcast due entirely to my own negligence and the consequences of my actions coming home to roost. It's Thursday today and I have no episode for tomorrow. Now, in my defence, Bayer Leverkusen, my football team, won their first ever German league title on Sunday in 120 years. So, I lost about four days there. That was gone. And then after that, I threw caution to the wind on the podcast, and sure, it's my own fucking fault that I've got nothing. So, I put out a call on Instagram, and I said, has anyone got an idea for a podcast you want me to do? And I got some brilliant ideas. Some ideas were so brilliant that they will merit an entire episode on their own, and I will get to them. But then this sparked a further idea of just thinking, I'll ask I'll ask you what questions you want to ask me. And I'll just fire through them for an episode. So that's what we're going to be doing. Doing then. Today I'll be addressing all of your questions and topics. And listen, if it's not addressed, if you reached out to me, one of two things has happened. Either you're too late and I've already started to hit record. Or it was such a good idea that it's going to get its own episode. So don't fret. Fuck knows how long this episode's going to take. So go stick a straw in something tropical and get settled in. I'm drinking a Fanta Lemon Zero out of a Beamish glass. Some very, very big ice cubes. Okay, first thing. Am I hitting that pad? Yeah. Fuck's sake, Gareth. First thing. Okay, loads of people asked for this. The recent New York Philharmonic sexual abuse scandal. Scandal's not the wrong... Scandal's the wrong word. There's nothing scandal is about. It's just a pack of wankers. Scandal implies there's maybe two sides of the story or some kind of debate to be had. Absolutely fuck that. It's a disgrace. Now, a lot of you asked me to do this, and I will get around to that, but that episode needs a lot of prep. It's a very delicate subject. There's some, there's victims involved, so I'll be very careful of how I approach it. I'm going to do my best to actually try and get the journalist on to talk about it, who wrote the article for Vulture, wasn't it? So if anyone knows that person, reach out if you have a contact for me and send me just Instagram. And, or if you know anyone that is close to the case or has inside and knowledge on it or who wants, who's relatively knowledgeable and would like to talk about it, get them up. Uh, let me know. Because I will definitely be on it. It actually broke my heart on TikTok because there's that girl, I hope I don't pronounce her name wrong, has fucking news on this podcast, Anastasia, or Anastasia. Anastasia, do you send her in America? Anastasia Golden, or Anastasia? I'm all out of love. <laughs> That's Anastasia. Uh, she put a thing on TikTok. She's a great content creator on TikTok. She makes amazing stuff for the flute. And I've watched her for a few years now, and she gets so many people interested in the flute. She's doing great, but she's a very young girl, and she'll be entering the career or the industry quite soon if she hasn't already and it breaks my heart that she has to come out and talk about this I st- it just didn't register with me that it's still such a thing these days that's why i was so shocked and disappointed with the story breaking i know it's bad but i thought we were all getting over this a little bit like 10 years ago when i was entering the industry we knew how bad it was but nobody talked about it but to see people who are at the start of their careers having to enter with this kind of news breaking Breaks my fucking heart. People like that shouldn't have to talk about this kind of thing. They should be... We should be over this by now. But here, fucking hell. Anyway, I'll get to that. First thing people want me to talk about. Uh, but Have you got any busking tips or non-institutional performance tips? Oh, mummy. You've hit on a topic here. Now, firstly, for both of these, fucking do them. I'm a performing musician. This is how I make most of my money in my life. And I went to quite a few conservatoires. I studied to quite a high level, if I do say so myself. Now, one thing I will say about conservatoires, you're not trained to get fucking paid. It is ridiculous. There's this weird taboo in music college that you don't talk about money. Like, you never mention it. In the entire time I studied at all my music colleges, not once did any professor give me a number of how much I can expect to be paid, what the average gig fee is, how much I should be looking to charge, how much you get paid in an orchestra for a gig. I hadn't a fucking clue. It's a disgrace. And I think the main reason for that is just because so many people are rich at music college and have funding that they don't care. They can afford to buy fucking 10 instruments and fly across the world for master classes and have their parents bankroll it. It's fucking ridiculous. So they don't talk about money. But the rest of us, normal people, we need to fucking eat. We need to pay rent, man. So... What I'm going to start with, 
Okay, this is very important. No matter what you're told, if you studied or if you are currently studying for a music performance degree especially, you are qualified to get paid to play music. Period. Just like any other fucking degree, you've studied to a high level, you've learned your craft, you're good enough guaranteed. Don't give me this shit of like, not your shit, music college drills this into this, but don't give me the shit of like, oh, I can't get paid because I, I, I did do music performance, but I didn't go to Juilliard, or I didn't go to the Royal Academy, or I didn't go to Paris, so I'm not good enough. Bollocks, if you've got to that level and you've studied for that long, you are good enough at your instrument to start making some fucking money off it, guaranteed. But I will say, we have to find ways to do it. And programming, choosing your music is everything okay Stephen Clark actually talked about this on his Instagram recently and I couldn't agree more and that is a man that knows how to make money that is a man who's properly learned the trade of being a gig musician he's a fucking genius for this kind of stuff when you go to music college it's great studying things like the Hindemith Sonata okay it's wonderful but trust me when you get out of college nobody is going to pay you to play the fucking Hindemith Sonata I promise you even top flute players probably don't get fucking paid to play it so when it comes to busking do it just fucking do it. I did loads of it. I still do a fair amount of it. I don't have to do as much as I had to. I do it now more for fun than money. But I love it. I've done it with Irish music groups. I've done it with trios. I've done it with quartets. I've done it with wing quintets. I've done it with fucking everything. I've bust with Kulau. That music. You know, Kulau, the guy that wrote all the fucking flute trios. And I've made good money off it. So, if you're doing classical music for the programming, just please make sure it is tonal, first of all, and fun. Lively does help a bit too, okay? So, you don't have to water it down. You don't have to make some stupid shit or like shite arrangements of Ness and Dorma or the Godfather theme. You can do Kulau or Devien or Mozart or fucking Tafanel. All this music is great. It works so well to busk with him. Or do you have a mate that plays the guitar and they don't like singing? Go get a few pop songs. Go learn the fucking the vocal line of a few pop songs. Play them in the street. You'll get fucking loads of money off it. I promise. It's not hard to do. Okay, if you can't get the notes for it, go find a piano score. Find an illegal one off the internet. Just Google it. For fuck's sake. Free PDF for Taylor Swift. Shake it off. Easy. Write out the flute part. Stick it on an iPad. Bring a music stand with you. Put the iPad up. Your guitar player will be happy because it's easy fucking chords. The songs they probably already know. Play a few of them. Stick a hat out. Bob's your uncle. Fanny's your aunt. You're away. You can sight read them. I promise. Get an iPad. Do it with that. If you can afford one, if you have one already, use an iPad. Don't be fucking about with music. Get the iPad up and away you go. Just fucking do it. With busking, you're shy for like two minutes. Okay, that's all it is. We tried to busk last year. No, I not last St. Patrick's Day, but the one before that with my Irish trio. We had loads of gigs, and I was like, we've got an article in the middle. Do you want to go in the street and play? And the violin player was like, no, I'm way too nervous for that. I'm like, you're playing gigs? We're getting paid for this. You can definitely play in the fucking street. And she's like, no, no, I'm too shy. And you don't need to be shy. You're shy for like two minutes. And then the minute you start, you're like, actually, this is fucking fine. Now, with busking, there is license and laws. Sometimes you have to have a license to busk. Fuck all that. Okay, fuck that. Don't bother with all that shit, right? Just go and do it. I've done it everywhere. The worst thing that's going to happen is the police are going to come up to you and go, right, can you fuck off now, please? That's it. See all the licensing, the fucking all that shit? Fuck that. Just go do it. You're not going to go to jail, all right? The worst thing is just going to say, right, would you mind? Don't go on someone else's turf. That's probably a good bit of advice. If there's a busker that's normally there, or they come up to you and say, this is my spot, respect them and fuck off because they're making a living too. But go and play. You're better to ask for... What's that phrase? You're better to ask for forgiveness than you are for permission. No, aye. You're better to ask for forgiveness than you are for permission. Fuck it, just do it. Who gives a fuck? And you'll learn a lot from busking. You'll learn things that music colleges don't teach you. You'll learn how to be a normal fucking musician and just go out and play like all those lads with guitars do it. You have to be shite. You have to have a period of being shite at being a musician. <clears throat> being a performing musician is a different skill set to studying or to playing your instrument. The actual skill of performance is different. And every other genre of music, we let them have that period of being shite, make mistakes. Music college doesn't allow you to do that. Every performance you do in music college is examined, critiqued, analyzed to fucking death. It's never not stressful. The least stressful is a performance class for your colleagues. It's not not stressful. You need to go out and learn the skill that is just making music and what music is at its core and the purpose of music. You play tunes to entertain people. And your audiences, when you're out in the working world, are people that... It's been a long week and they've bought a ticket to a concert. Or even if you're doing free concerts and they've taken a bit of time out of their schedule to come and watch you because they want to be entertained. They don't want to work. They want to go and watch a bit of flute and have a bit of crack. You need to get used to that audience. 
Get used to being shite in front of them and get better at it. That's the reality of it. You're not playing these big fucking deep philosophical concerts all the time. You're just playing tunes and getting money for it. It's fucking great. Same thing for non-institutional events. And this is where you're going to make your bread and butter money. This is where I get most of my performing money. Because you can charge a lot of fucking money for it. If you have an idea for a group or a chamber music or a band, just go and do it. Don't wait till it's perfect. That's the worst thing. Do you know what I hate? The word hopefully. I hate this thing of like, oh, hopefully one day we'll get a wee group or hopefully one day we'll play together or hopefully I'll do that again. Fuck hopefully. Get off your hole and go and do it. Fuck it. If you've got even the slightest seed of an idea of making a chamber group or playing with people, text someone and just say, listen, all I've got so far is all I know is I want to play with someone else and maybe get out in public and do it. That's it. You don't have to have an idea about repertoire or style or anything. You just say, that's all I know. Two brains are better than one. Get someone to jump on with you. And it flies. Cut your teeth. Learn to be a musician. Do this kind of shit. Don't wait till it's perfect. It's never fucking perfect. And then find a venue. At the start, you do have to do free shit. Okay, that's normal. Go and find a venue. Where to find venues? Just imagine where you sit in your life. Do you go to a cafe and think, fuck, a wee bit of flute here would be lovely. See these wee hipster cafes? Text the owner and say, do you mind if I come in and do a wee fucking half hour set? I'll do it for free or I'll do it for a coffee the first time. Get some stuff on your Instagram. Do that. Build it up. You will learn as a musician. And the free gigs, they disappear quick. If you get the right venues and stuff, they disappear fucking quick. They're more for you just to get performance experience. But they do go quick. With our Irish band, we did free gigs at the start, like a year ago. And then very quickly, I was like, okay, we're new to Irish music, but we're fucking good musicians and we can do this and we can charge money for it. And now, like I charge our band for a private function. I don't put a lot of this on Instagram because I don't like to post about private functions. That's our bread and butter. We charge over a thousand euro for 45 minutes of music. It's great. And travel costs and all that with it. Those rich Germans love Irish music. They're delighted with it. They've got the money. We play. Brilliant. And I'm learning to be a musician. You have to learn by doing. You just have to do it. Like, the skills you learn performing in those kind of venues directly translate. I did St. Patrick's Day a few years ago when I was in Cardiff. A lot of years ago. And three days later, I had my first ever professional orchestral gig doing second flute and some Beethoven stuff. And on the day of St. Patrick's Day, we gigged like six times. And... It got me so used to being comfortable on stage and just understanding that I'm playing music, people want to listen to it. And I took that feeling and I remembered that feeling when I went on stage with a professional orchestra. And it was the same thing. I was like, yeah, it's, it is just playing music. There's no big deal to it. So just fucking go and do it. Listen, if you need a sounding board, you need a hype man. Anyone out there that's thinking of ideas and if you're one of those musicians like I was, you're like, fuck, I, I've trained all my life and I don't play. Message me. I'll find you a way to get out and fucking play and make some money off it. I promise. Okay, that was a long question, but the next one's will go a bit quicker. Thank you for that one, though. That is a very good topic. That was disgusting. I'm very sorry. I've got this strange Irish disease that still hasn't went. Every time I go back to Ireland, I catch something over there. Again, things that we haven't seen in the, the, the developed world for many a year. But us Irish are just used to it. But I'm, I'm too much of a European fanny now. My immune system's too European. The fuck, I found the lemon is delicious. That Beamish glass is gorgeous. I didn't pay for that, obviously. It's straight in the pocket. There's a pub in Belfast doing Beamish. It's a very rare thing. Beamish is like the cork version of Guinness. You don't see it outside of cork very often. And we all ordered four pints. And I was like, right, open that handbag up, bar. The one of me, it's like, open that handbag up. Take those four glasses with you. They're coming with us. If anyone's ever, if you've ever paid for a Guinness glass, you're a fucking idiot. Okay. Uh, next question. My favorite chamber music pieces. Good question. I'm guessing this means flute. So, if it does... The obvious thing is, for me, the Debussy Trio. For flute, viola, and harp. And the problem with the Debussy Trio is, it's such a core part of the repertoire, but we never play it, because we never get to study it at music college, because we're not really a soloist in it, so it doesn't really fit into programs anywhere, unless you're specifically studying chamber music. So a lot of flute players will go the whole lives without playing it, and then probably won't listen to it either. It's fucking gorgeous. It is one of the gems of the flute chamber music repertoire. So if you don't know it, go and listen to it. There is one obvious recording. It's by a woman called uh, Magdalene Monnier, previous guest on the podcast and the best flute player in the fucking world. Uh, she did a version with Antoine Tamistet and Xavier Demest. And I think it was Harmonia Mundi. It was a smaller label that did it. It won a fucking... It won a something. I want to say it won a Grammy, but... Is there a UK version of the Grammys? It won a something. It was very good. Uh, I also love the Mozart Flute Quartet in D major. The piece of repertoire I would love to play the most in the world. And the version for that, if you want to listen to it, Bartol Kuyikin. Bartol Kuyikin. Good luck trying to spell that. K-U-J-I-K-E-N. Kuyikin. He's Dutch. 
He plays on period instruments. Fucking unbelievable. And lastly, for flute, wind quintets. I fucking love them. So if you're not familiar with the wind quintet, it is flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and French horn. Because we need someone in there. Sometimes they replace French horn with saxophone. We did that in music college a lot. It's actually, it works quite well. But there's great music for wind quintets. You know, Taffanel wrote stuff. Hindemith wrote stuff. Ravel, fucking, what do you call it? Malcolm Arnold wrote stuff. There's some great stuff for it. Ligeti. The Ligeti Bagatelles, like your six of them for Wind Quintet, fucking amazing. Now, if you want to go listen to Wind Quintet, there's an undeniable number one group. It's called Les Vents Français. Vents spelt like vents for the Americans among you. And in it, you have Francois Leleu on oboe, Paul Meyer on clarinet, Gilbert Audin on bassoon, uh, Vladkovic on horn and on flute, of course, Mr. Emmanuel Pau. It's all the players from the Berlin Phil. It's fucking wild. And if they ever get a piano player in to join, which they often do, it'll be um, Eric Lesage. Eric Lesage. It's fucking incredible. They've got loads of albums with all that rep. It's amazing. Or another one, Variation 5 is the name of the group, but you have to spell Variation and then the figure 5 and not put a space between the two. Um, they have one album out on Spotify. It's uh, Sebastian Mance on clarinet. Ramon Ortega on horn, no, oboe, sorry, Marc Tranel on bassoon, uh, David Fernandez on horn, and Magali Monnier on flute. It's fucking great. I saw them live in Cologne a few times. Brilliant. They have a great album out with like the big hits of the flute, or the wing quintet rep. Uh, next question. Flute music and mainstream pop music. This is for Katarina. Sorry, I'm calling you out in the podcast. Uh, Kat, honestly, most of it's shite. My favourite is Enter Shikari. That's what got me, like, kept my, uh, love for the flute up when I was a teenager. I loved Enter Shikari. I was fucking mad for them. And I'm thinking of the third album, Common Dreads, the first song is called The Jester and has a flute solo at the start of it. Do you want to know the saddest story of my life? Yeah, I'll tell this. I've got time. The saddest story of my life, if I haven't told this in the podcast already, was I was 14. I saw Enter Shikari three times in three days. Went to, twice to Belfast and once to Dublin. I fucking loved them. They were like a... They're still going. They're like a... They're screamo music with a lot of electronics and quite heavy guitars, but they're... They were a bit seen as well at the time. I don't know if we still say scene kid or emo music. It was kind of a blend of all that. They were fucking great. And the jester had a flute solo at the start, but it was a MIDI one they used just for it. I sent an email to their manager when I was 14 saying, I would like to offer my services for free. And I made a CV for it to say I would like to play flute in their tour. And they never got back to me. But still, I think about that quite often. I wonder if I messaged them the word. If anyone knows Roy Reynolds from Enter Shikari... Let him know I'm still available and I'm still willing to do it for fuck all. Uh, other ones, Lizzo, I suppose, but she's cancelled now because she called one of her backing dancers fat, which is, yeah, yeah that's a pot calling the kettle black girl, love. She actually did it the week after she was in Belfast. She made a fucking TikTok of her running about Belfast looking for a spice bag. Then she has a cheek to call her backing dancers fat and body shame them. Fuck off, love. And yeah, fuck her. Her music's actually class, but fuck Lizzo. Uh, Jethro Tull is the one people always say, but here, hot take, Jethro Tull, shite. <laughs> shite. I went to a concert once thinking it'd be cool. It's a load of stoner dad music. Man, it's shite. Fuck it. There's not really much flute in mainstream music and for good reason. There is a hell of an arrangement of Marty Bum by the Arctic Monkeys for flute and piano by a very sexy Northern Irish flute player on YouTube. Next question. Compilation of Therese. Anyone who watched the podcast episode with Jad, I hope you noticed the cat going about. The hairless cat, Therese. My intention was to make a clip of that, of just her best moments, but I, I've just been so fucking busy. Making clips takes fucking ages, man, and I just haven't got around to it. I will, though. I promise I will. Next question. What are the sexiest flute performances? Okay. I actually do have an automatic answer to this, but I'm going to balance this out, okay, by trying to say a guy and a girl, so I don't look like a creep. But also, I should say, sexy performances in the way that, you know the way you look at people like Mick Jagger, and people fancy him, even though he's obviously being fucking weekend at Bernie's. He's nearly dead. He's a big bag of bones, a big bony arse on him. But people still fancy him because he's a musician. You, I get that with classical musicians all the time, especially flute players. There's times we look at him and just go, in that moment when you're playing that piece, you're so attractive it actually fucking hurts. So, uh, two, two examples. One that I vividly remember having a big effect on me was Irina, Irina Sachinskaya, unbelievable flute player. She plays like the fucking devil, man. She did, there was a video someone did just on their phone of her doing an encore at a, a concert, solo flute, the Paganini Caprice, not the, 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 not the last one, but it's one of the ones in the middle. Uh, that one fucking unbelievable i was weak at the knees boy 
unbelievable. So that's the sexiest flute performance. The other one, I thought for a guy, I was going to say that video of Manuel Pauli playing Lenski's aria with Katia Bunyatishvili. Because it is gorgeous and it works so well, but to be honest, I'm only saying that for Katia because I love Katia Bunyatishvili for, for, for two reasons. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, I might have to cut that out. Next question. When is there an episode with Mozart in brackets cat? That's my girlfriend that's done that. Who's going to be delighted about this episode? Um, My cat's called Mozart and we've had the idea for a long time of interviewing him for the podcast. But I think the novelty would wear off quickly after like 30 seconds. So it might be a TikTok video at some time. We called him Mozart. I wanted to call him Ludwig. But it's an ugly as fuck name for a cat. So we called him Mozart. Oh, bless me, Mozart. He's like, wait, is Mozart? No, he must be 14, 15. He's a wee old man. He's a very nice cat. Uh, any flutes in film? And can you interview Will Ferrell? Listen, genuinely, I have a list of people I want to interview for this podcast. And I have like a wee extra list. Like a wee dream podcast list of like famous people that are somehow connected to the flute. And the two big ones are Will Ferrell and Kylian Mbappe, the footballer that plays for France and PSG. The fucking scumbag. He'll knock him on now, I suppose. Um, I haven't got them. If anyone has a number for Will Fell, please do hit me up there. Tell, you can tell him there's a, a Dr. Pepper strawberries and cream in it for him. Why are Celtic tunes so hard? <laughs> do you want to know the honest answer to this? Okay. I'm assuming you mean Celtic tunes and not Celtic. Celtic's the football team. Celtic is, you know, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Very big difference. Although I do love the Celtic. Uh, honest answer why people love them across the world so much. Irish music. I genuinely think it's a trope. And there's a trope about Irish and Scottish culture, Celtic culture, around mysticism. And it's very similar. So a trope is like an idea that sort of reoccurs and it's so like it's done so fucking much that it's almost a stereotype of itself. So one of the big tropes in American culture, which don't cancel me for saying this, it is a thing, okay? It was a thing. Uh, it was called the Magical Negro which is fucking ridiculous, right? But I've got the definition here. In the cinema of the United States, the magical Negro is a supporting stock character who comes to the aid of white protagonists in a film. Magical Negro characters, often possessing special insight or mystical powers, have long been a tradition in American fiction. So it's like that. Ca- all the movies from the 70s have it, you know, where they're struggling to do something and then some mysterious black person comes along who somehow is very in touch with nature and mysticism and spirituality and gives them some kind of tool to solve their problem. It happens all the fucking time. I genuinely think the love, especially in America, for Celtic music is something like that. There's some kind of air of mysticism because of things like Lord of the Rings, where Elvish is basically just fucking Irish. If you if you hear Elvish spoken, you listen to Irish being spoken, they're basically the same thing. Americans think we're all in touch with nature and fucking banshees and leprechauns. Leprechauns aren't even Irish. We don't even have leprechauns. That's an American invention. We do have banshees. And we do have ba- banshees do exist as well. My granddad swore he heard one once. Well, he swore he saw one at the bottom of the bed. Okay, we are a wee bit superstitious as people now say that. That's the reason why I think Irish music is so popular. But also, it's just fucking gorgeous, isn't it? You know, Irish music is so, so full. We have a real, we have a real skill to be able to communicate. It's probably the only skill we'll have. I think we're the country in the world with the most uh, Nobel, Nobel fucking literature prizes. Nobel Peace Prize for literature, is that right? You know what I mean, the big one for literature, uh, for writers, in per capita. We've had so many great writers over the year because communication is so essential in Ireland. So even as writers, we've had James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, Oscar Wilde, Seamus Heaney, people like that, Flan O'Brien. And I think the music is very similar. There's just a desperate need in Irish music to communicate a very clear idea. The songs especially tell a very clear story. My song at the minute I'm obsessed, obsessed with is The Black Velvet Band. We're playing it in a concert tomorrow night and I'm fucking obsessed. It's a beautiful song. Uh, next one, straight up talk about Debussy for an hour. I would love to talk about Debussy for an hour, but I'll write an episode for it. To be honest, I've done one on Ebert. I've done a lot of things on Ravel because I love Ravel. Debussy's music is incredible. Debussy as a person, I think he's a bit of a wanker. I don't like him. I always prefer always prefer Ravel. Always prefer him. I think Debussy's a bit of a prick. I think between the two, Ravel is the more endearing one. He had cats and Debussy just seemed like a bit of a prick. Uh, but I'll get to that eventually, I promise. When are we going to see an Inline G, England B crossover? In, in, inline G, England B. Say that four times fast. Uh, soon. I know who wrote this, but... I have two podcasts. I think I've mentioned this before. I have another podcast that I co-host and co-run with a guy called Joe Edwards, a very good friend of mine here. Um, and it's a football podcast called The England B Team. It's a play on 
I know for any Brits among you, you'll know the movie Mike Bass and England Manager. It's a play on that because I'm Irish and he's English. So it's a great podcast. We have a lot of fun doing it. Um, it's definitely, in my podcasting life, it's the more fun one of the two. I enjoy making that podcast more than I enjoy making this one because we just do it when we're ready. We don't have stress to to publish it and also Joe handles all the social media so I don't get cancelled but I've spoke to him I would love to do a crossover I'm just trying to get the script and the time so we can talk about the relationship between sport and music and flute and football specifically and it'd be fun to like host a different podcast with him it'd be very fun so that will be coming soon uh who is behind Gary Houston Toots's flute seat fuck me this is getting an episode and people think I'm making this up. There is an account on Instagram that's been running for years called Gary Houston Toots' Flutesy, and it's pictures of me. You just have to go check it out. It's pictures of me, and it's someone who's making funny videos about me. Totally anonymous. I have spent years trying to find this person, and I mean years. Whoever's running it is doing a fucking amazing job because they haven't spilt the secret. Whoever's running it hasn't met me in a pub and just went, oh, fucking right. I'll tell you now, it was me. Years and they disappeared for a while. Then I put up a status saying, Where are these people? Or this guy, or this girl, or whatever. And then they suddenly they're back. They're back and they're posting more content. I have genuinely done a worrying amount of research to try and find out who this is. I've done proper detective shit. I've Sherlocked the fuck out of this and I still don't know. I will do an episode on this, but I haven't found the person yet. My two biggest suspicions have already been proved unwrong. Because, well, I don't know if I should say this in case Hughie Twitches Fruits is listening, but there was a you left a clue in your last video you were you were reckless you were careless you're getting the thrill out of it too much and you're getting sloppy and i nearly got you so i will fucking find this person uh next question who's your best friend <laughs> i know who wrote this so i'm gonna say the person he asked me my best friend Chad. uh oh fuck me i i really am answering all these by the way i'm not gonna leave any of them out what is raccoon glue not answering that i love raccoons and i don't want to know about their glue uh, next question. Favourite American flutist? Trick question. I don't have any. <laughs> Fuck you. No, I'm joking. There actually are some great flute players over on the other side of the pond. Uh, especially the ones who aren't so American, if you know what I mean. I'm very attached to the artist as a person. So if I don't like the artist as a person, I think they're dog shit as a player. I cannot connect to a musician if I think they're an asshole. Or if I think they're just too fucking American. You know that mega American? You're like, they should be working as a waitress in Chili's, but they're somehow I got a job as a flute player to American but Americans that do rock uh Kyle Wincense unbelievable listened to her the whole way through college my teacher Welsh college was a massive fan of her Seth Morris is class Seth Morris is amazing fucking amazing plays wonderfully seems like a really cool dude I really like him Thomas Nyfinger was one I used to listen to a lot at college again obviously he's dead since what 1990 a couple of people told me he might have been a bad boy, which breaks my heart now. So if I find out that's true, fuck Thomas Nightfinger. But for American flute players, you come straight to my mind. Mark Sparks is the other one. A really good player. Seriously underrated Mark Sparks. I think he's just signed on with that tongue based thing. You know, that online like masterclass thing. So you should go check it out to watch him. I mean, I'm not going to check it out because I'm not stupid enough to fucking pay for it. But you can pay for it. Or you can sign up to the Patreon. I forgot to put a Patreon read it. Fuck, I'll do that in a minute. Uh, do you know who my number one American food player is? And this is God's honest truth. It's a girl called Molly McLaughlin. Because years ago, she put up a video. And she has two YouTube accounts. Because I found them all last night. Because I looked for her a few years ago and she disappeared. And then she's back apparently. And I was just thinking about this last night. When I thought of American food players, her name came back to my head. She put up a couple of audition videos. And I know she meant to put them public. There's only three videos on her account. And she does a lot of crossover, like Irish music stuff. I said this, it was a, I can't remember the name of the tune, it was a jig anyway, and for solo flute, you know, classical flute, and she'd arranged it in like an Ian Clark kind of way, you know, like lots of special effects, lots of extended techniques, tongue slaps, this weird, there's this mad moment in the middle of it where it sounds like a rocket going off, and I just fell in love with it, fell in love with her as well, to be honest, I was in, this is my days when I was like 18 and I was obsessed with Zoe Deschanel, or anyone with a fucking polka dot dress on and a, and a pixie haircut, so... Molly Bullock and I fell in love with her and she's my favourite American flute player and if she's watching this I'm going to be so fucking embarrassed. That's one person that if I got to meet her because I was obsessed with those videos I tried like I transcribed them I tried to write them out I could never get it the way she did and then at the time there was no social media for her she wasn't well known and I just couldn't find her I was trying so hard to try and find her so I could just say can you teach me how to do that it's so fucking cool and then I found her again when I was thinking about this last time She's done loads of shit. She's got loads of projects on. And they're all fucking amazing. 
So she's still there. So if anyone knows Molly, please tell her. She's genuinely my favourite American flute player. And I would love to have her on the podcast. She's incredible. Uh, okay. I feel like a, I feel like a schoolboy. Gareth and Molly sitting in the tree. <laughs> uh, fuck. I'm not even drunk, man. This is not alcohol. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Tips. Jesus, Gareth. Uh... Yeah, sorry. Tips for teaching vibrato on flute for a clarinet intruder. I know who wrote this, but I know who wrote them all, obviously. Um, this is one of the original OG Inline G fans. This person I went to college with. I'll not reveal their name because they don't want to reveal. But they were a clarinet player at college. I remember when they started, because I think... Correct me if I'm wrong when you're listening to this, but you started in the second year. We were already all there for a year. And I didn't know this person. And their first concert, they played the Weber concertino for clarinet and i was like holy fuck and i still remember that concert i still remember watching that and she, this uh, fuck this person anyway listens to every single episode of the podcast and it is incredibly nice to hear that really warm my heart to hear that teaching vibrato i actually do teach vibrato to all my students i teach a lot i don't tell people i teach as much i think because i haven't you know the way flute players are like oh no i've only got one spot left sign up quick you know all that shit I actually don't have any slots, really. Like, I have maybe space for one or two more, but if I was starting to take on more students, I would have to sack off the other work I'm doing because I am swamped with students in a minute. But anyway, I do teach vibrato. I think it's really important to teach vibrato um, because my vibrato, when I was younger, was wide enough that you could fucking jump through it. It was awful. So I had to learn vibrato. Some people can do it naturally, and if you can, fair play to you. But easiest way to do it comes from the diaphragm. I don't care what anyone says. I use it from the diaphragm. comes down there. If you do it from your throat, you sound like a fucking belly goat. And you play a long note and you do the ha movement. How to find the ha movement? Pant like a dog. Go, <laughs> put your hand in your belly. You feel where that moves up. That's where the vibrato comes from, okay? For a good bit of it. Emily Bainan does this as well. She teaches this too. And if she does it, then fuck, it must be right. Go and do it. Stick a metronome on 60. Do crotchets on a long note. Just go, bah, bah, bah. then do quavers, triplets, semi quavers. Get it faster and faster and faster. See how far I can get. When the metronome's on 60, I can get the. Sex triplets, I think. Just about. My vibrato is still not as fast as I would like it to be. But if I do that for like a week straight, it starts to pick up a bit again. Train it. Train like any other muscle. And experiment with how deep you want to make it. How heavy you want to make it. So you can push stronger, push lighter. And then also, like phrasing music, learn how to bring it in with the cellarando. Learn how to bring it in with the crescendo. Practice that. Practice a long phrase. I love doing a long note. I'm blowing it louder and louder and louder without vibrato to the point where I'm pushing it so much that vibrato feels like it needs to come in. And that natural point where it comes in. That witch on Facebook, I'll not say who, but you all know who I mean if you're flute players, that old American witch we have talked about here before. She put out a status one saying it's never appropriate to start vibrato in the middle of the note. Absolutely go fuck yourself, love. Like, go fuck yourself. She's like, it always should be at the start of the note. No, it shouldn't. There are some times where bringing in vibrato story in the middle of a note is fucking gorgeous. Is sexy as fuck. Don't listen to her. Do whatever you want with your vibrato. It's your vibrato. Fucking enjoy yourself. If people like it, they'll enjoy it. If they don't like it, well, that's it. But there's no rules. It's music. But practice that. Play louder and louder and louder. Let the vibrato come in naturally. And whoa, 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 whoa. I love that. Definitely practice it in every way you can. Treat it like treat it like music. Also, treat it as well of where which pulse of the vibrato you're going to stress. So you might do vibrato, you might think of it in groups of four, and you stress the first one, and then let, let, let the next three go a little bit lighter. Like if you practice semi quavers if you're playing Baroque music, you wouldn't go ta 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 you ta 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 You can do that with vibrato too. It works really well. Treat it like you're learning fast music. Treat it as a part of your plan. And just practice it. It works. It really fucking does. Okay. Uh, when are you coming to Toronto? Fucking soon, I hope. I'm genuinely thinking about this because I am coming to America this summer. I'm going to be there, lads. I'm coming to the NFA. I'm hoping I get a bit of financial aid for it. I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but they do offer financial aid because I have spent all my savings on the flights. I mean this when I say this. I am fucking skint. Like, living in Germany is expensive. I have a very nice flat. Well, not very nice. I have a flat. I have my own flat. And I'm skint. I just about make ends meet. I can save a wee bit of money every month. Paying for the flights was fucking hard. So I'm hoping to get financial aid. If I don't, I will get the money together to go anyway. I'm flying over, so I'll find the money to go, like the convention fee and all that. 
But when I was doing all that, I thought, okay, I can do this. I can save up for this over the period of eight months or nine months. I can save up enough money to do a trip. So my next one is either New York or Canada. I've got family in Canada and would love to go. I'm talking about Canada as if it's like, just go to Canada. Sure, it's tiny. You can jump from city to city. Toronto will be the one to go to now because you guys are there. You know, the, the Canada food team are there. I feel there's an affinity with Canada now. It's great. I really want to go. I'm heartbroken that none of you guys are going. None of the Canadian flute team are going to the NFA. I know it's millions. It's probably as far away for you as it is for me. But my head, I'm like, yeah, you're on that side of the pond. So, but yeah, I will come to Toronto. And I want to know what you eat in Toronto. Do they eat poutine there? Is Toronto French speaking? Because I can speak French. Although, oh, it's Quebec, isn't it? That speaks French. Because Quebecois is what you call it in French. Cannot understand a fucking word they're saying when Canadians speak French. But I would love to come. So maybe if I can find a way to get funded for it or if I can find an excuse to go there, like a podcast episode or something or a gig or something. Yeah, maybe. But soon, I promise. I'm watching the story of the Peterborough Symphony with Jill, Jill Flutes, previous guest of the podcast, and Jay Martha Wildfoot, previous guest of the podcast, together, warmed my heart, and I was like, man, I want to go and sit with him, and fucking watch, I don't know, what would we watch? They might say watch, what do you call that shit? Twilight. I've never seen Twilight. I'll just chat shit. Anyway, soon, favourite female composer, I'll tell you who it's not, Shamanad. Shite. I hate that fucking piece. Shamanad is so shit as a piece of music. Shite. Average composer, bang average, fucking shite. Tell you who I do like, Mel Bonis, French composer, wrote a flute stu- a couple of flute stuff, wrote a flute sonata, wrote great piano music. And I see a friend of mine here in Cologne, Miriam, Miriam Balbo Cohen, she did the complete works of Mel, or not the complete works, but like a good selection of works from Mel Bonis for piano. Great album. So Mel Bonis is great. My favourite though, I, it took me a few seconds to think about this, and then when I find this answer in my head, I was like, obviously it's that one, is Kaya Sario, the Finnish conductor or conductor, well, com- conductor as well, but composer. Uh, Kaya Sario, she's based in Paris, I think, still. She was there when I was there. She's wrote a lot of flute stuff. Fucking amazing. Very contemporary. I adore contemporary music. Brilliant. Kaya Sario is a fucking fierce woman as well. Massive fan. Also, for anyone listening who wants to know more about female composers, there is a great resource out there. Uh, Polani Flute. Polaniflute.com. Or you can find her on Instagram as well. She is churning out so much content. Every time I see it, I'm like, this is fucking gold. It's so informative. I'm amazed that more people aren't following her or talking to her. She is doing incredible work. So Poulani Flute, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've talked about her before on the podcast. P-U-A-L-A-N-I. Poulani. She is putting out so much stuff about women in classical music and women in comp- composition and flute. Gold. Absolute gold. Her website and her blog and all. It's fucking incredible. More people need to go listen to it. Uh, next question. What brand of flute do you play and why isn't it an Altus? I play a Thank You. I fucking love my Thank You. I adore it. I play a five card gold Thank You, which they don't make anymore. They stopped making them because of discoloration. Mine's lightly coated in 14 card gold because of the discoloration issue. So they didn't make it anymore. It's a beautiful flute. I love Thank You. Very happy with them. Um, why do I not play Altus? Because all the British players play Altus. So fuck them. And British players are the most boring flute players in the fucking world. They're nearly as bad as the Yanks. So, fuck them. No. Altus actually make incredible instruments. And I'm, I'm amazed that Altus are not bigger in the States. They seem to only be big in Britain. Which is very strange to me because they make beautiful instruments. And, like, in Britain they are the gold standard. Everyone's playing on an Altus these days. Uh, what's better, silver or silver? <laughs> I play on gold. And I tell you, the only reason I play on gold is because I found a gold flute that I can afford. That's it. That's the only reason why. I've always dreamed of playing on a gold flute. That flute was €10,000. It's a shitload of money, but for a gold flute, it's affordable. And I was looking for a new flute for years. Used my life savings on it. My dad was putting money into a bank account for me since I was a kid. You know, like 10 quid a month or something to pay for something. Pay for a deposit on a house maybe or something like that. Nah, straight on this bad boy here. And I only play on gold because I like the look. (laughs) And that's very childish of me to say, but I feel like I have a superpower when I play on a gold flute. Uh, okay, last few questions. Uh, favorite key? Easy. Uh, C sharp minor. C sharp minor is a sexy key, man. Some great pieces in C sharp minor. It's a very dark, murky, like languishing kind of key. Unrequited love, stormy. Uh, the Moonlight Sonata. I hope I'm right in saying that. I know it's a C sharp minor. Uh, Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu. C sharp minor. Poulenc Piano Concerto. C sharp minor. Tchaikovsky. 
piano concerto c sharp minor great fucking key no doubts whatsoever my favorite and i love playing in it this is by the way you should practice your fucking scales because i have found in the last few years when i play c sharp minor i don't look at all those sharps or even when i play a d flat major and see all the flats i don't panic anymore because i practice my scales so much and i hate practicing scales but when i practice them my brain just locks in the d flat major mode and my fingers just do it they're just in d flat major mode there's no wrong notes because i'm not thinking about flats practice your fucking scales it really works practice all your major scales every day that's my warm-up every day i play the flute every single major scale two octaves do them all and then every harmonic minor melodic minors i struggle a wee bit with still but every day do that every day and i swear to god after like two months you will have an encyclopedic knowledge of how each key works the structure of it the color of it you'll be able to listen to music pieces of music and say oh that's a bit more d major well that's a bit c major practice them every day it takes literally okay at the start it doesn't take 10 minutes when you're doing it for the first time especially from memory it'll take you about a week but when you build it up it takes me three minutes to play through all the major minor scales and it's a great warm-up and you will musically sharp as a fucking tack boy favorite note i don't know a i have a love-hate relationship with a someone told me it was because i always feel like my age were out of tune and someone told me it was because of the thank you which i, I struggle to believe because thank you are a wonderful quality instrument but i think the scale they use might be different i don't know i've always struggled with a and then because i struggle with it so much i've practiced it a lot and I start to like A now. So this is high, not high A, like middle A. The one that Prokofiev Sonata starts on. I love that A. And I practice that a lot. It's not too open, it's not too close, it's very solid. I love A flat. I don't know, but I don't like G sharp. G sharp gives me anxiety. A flat, beautiful. Big fan of A flat. And the last question uh, just says, how toot flute? Toot flute? Toot with good teacher. Get good teacher to teach toot flute flute will toot itself guys by the way that's fucking you see toots flutes yeah i'm coming out you, you've been sloppy again right sorry uh lads that's 41 minutes holy fuck right let's get the fuck out of here thank you all for joining me for this really fun episode it was great um i'm back next week with an episode with a guest very fucking good guest i know i say that every time but another irish guest and i'm meeting one of the most famous flute players in the world next week for a drink and a podcast so you can stay tuned for that one anyway have a lovely weekend look after yourselves fucking go pet a dog go stroke a cat do something that makes you happy have a have a pint have a fanta lemon zero and i'll see you all next week big smooches Mwah. <laughs>